night, we had a hot cow, an in-person gathering, as well as a virtual Zoom component. And we began chapter 35, focusing on the existential question of why am I here? Find out why. So if you're virtual, you're missing my mushroom barley soup and you're missing the store-bought cake and chocolate and something else delicious looking that Rafael brought and our tea. So I would say you should do something for yourself. Get yourself a bowl of soup or if you can't whip one up that fast, at least a chocolate. And this is hot cow. So for those that are not sure what I'm talking about, let me explain. So we're going to start with a l'chaim. Oh, nice. If you do not have make something from your cabinet. This right. is this is the, the perks of being in person is you get something from Israel that's pretty nice. We are having a hakel. So Sarah and mm -hmm. Esther, you really lucked out. What's a hakel? For those of you that don't know, I'll explain briefly because for those of you that do know, you don't want a long explanation. But a hakel is a special, special, special commandment. Once every seven years, the year after the sabbatical year, every seven years, the Jewish people all gathered. It was the only time we all gathered, meaning every year we're supposed to gather three times a year to the temple. Didn't always happen. You couldn't make it that year. You weren't feeling well. You had a newborn baby. Your little kid's going to run around and make trouble anyway. You're getting older and tireder. It's not that every single Jew came to the temple three times a year. But once in every seven years, every single Jew came to the temple. Every man, every woman, every child. Because this is a can't miss it. It's happening only once in seven years experience. You can't say, okay, I'll go next holiday. It's going to be seven more years to the next gathering. So every Jew was there. And the king was reading from the Torah. And somehow they all fit, which makes no sense. But they all fit. The entire Jewish people. The entire people? Jewish people. It was at once? at once. It was recapsulating the giving of the Torah, Matan Torah. This was the giving of the Torah one more time. And just like by the giving of the Torah, we all fit. You could say, well, it was an open field, but still, we were all there. All three million of us and every single Jew that ever was or would be was at the giving of the Torah. Every single Jew, once in seven years, was there. And we all fit. And it was the most powerful thing just by virtue of us all being there. Then you have the king, and he's reading portions from the Torah designed to elicit our feelings, designed to elicit our fear of God. And you lived with that for seven more years. And then the temple was destroyed and it became something people learned about in the books and didn't think much about. And the Lavitcher Rebbe said, this is a happening now situation. Spiritually, it's a happening now situation. And it's not only the one day, this, depending on how you understand it, the first, the second night or second day of the holiday of Sukkot, of Sukkot, it's the entire year. This entire year, we have a special power. What's the power we have? Together, which is why I wanted to gather in person. So thank you, Rachel, and thank you for, I'm so happy we're gathered in person. But guess what? Everyone that's on with us is gathered virtually. And virtual reality, hey, it's reality. We think it's a modern thing. I was actually learning with someone a text. It's a famous Hasidic talk, and probably many of you have studied it on the essence of Hasidus. And at the end, the Rebbe is actually quoting uh, a law, a halakha, a law. And the law says that the four cubits, which works out to about six feet around a person, is their territory. So as you're walking, you have this invisible, we would call it virtual courtyard. It constantly moves with you. It's yours. And if something falls in that six foot circumference circle there, you got it. It's yours. It's a virtual territory. Wow. So virtual reality is not created now. It's been going uh -huh. on for a long time. So thank you for joining our virtual hot kill. Thank you for joining our in-person hot kill. Because I really want in-person because I really think hot kill is almost like an antidote to being separate. Hot kill means we got to be together. We want to be together. We get power by being together. But for those on the, on, on the screen, I'm really glad you're joining too. I want to share just very personally a memory. This was in 1988. And that was a Hakel year. It was the year after the sabbatical year. Mm -hmm. And Lubavitcher Rebbe was talking very strongly about Hakel. And I went home then, in the beginning of the, ho the holiday season in Sukkot, and I made a gathering for the women I knew in Baltimore. And I told them that this is a Hakel, and I explained the Hakel. And I guess because of the power of Hakel, they were inspired. And they said, we want to do this too. And they said, every month we're going to make a gathering. And a month later, a woman in Baltimore made a gathering. And... She sent me pictures. Remember in those days when if we wanted a picture, we printed it? So she sent me pictures, real deal printed pictures and with a 1988 camera. So they didn't look that amazing. I said, I have these pictures. What am I gonna do with them? 
what do I have them for? Obviously, I'm going to give them to the Rebbe because the Rebbe wants hot kale. So I wrote a report and I submitted it to the Rebbe and I got the most beautiful answer. The Rebbe said, Pain Tivaser Tov Tamid Kol Hayamin. Wow. So you should always have good news to say, wow. have good news to share, have good news to report. And sometimes in my life, when it didn't feel like I had such good news to report, It'd be like, no, no, no. The Rebbe said it's going to be always. Yeah, I'm not giving up on that one. You know, when you get that answer, you don't let anyone off the hook. You know, that's a bracha for it's life. It's a bracha for life. Exactly. I'm milking it for life. Like all of the answers we received, they're for life. So I took from there to get such an answer. It wasn't me. It was the power of the hakel. The Rebbe was so happy with the hakel that me, who only indirectly was involved, but sent the pictures, got such a beautiful answer. Well, you weren't involved because you did the first Right, I did the first one, so I so led to the this the next one, exactly. So this is our Hakel, and I hope so this class tonight should be even more powerful than it always is, and it's always amazing, and I always leave feeling great, um, because um, it's the power of Hakel. That's what we're focusing on, and Hakel is so connected to Mashiach, obviously, as that's when we're going to bet to have the entire Jewish people in the temple with the king reading the Torah. So this is a very, very Mashiach energy. And we have two birthday girls. So, yes. So we're going to make a L'chaim. We're making L'chaim to our two birthday girls. L'chaim, sorry. L'chaim, Esther. L'chaim, everyone on. Mazel tov. This hakel should help us as the purpose of a hakel to feel more Fear of God, love of God, feeling for God, relationship for God should last us way beyond seven years. L'chaim, and I hope everyone has something to drink. L'chaim. L'chaim, So we are going to actually start a new chapter. That's like so exciting. Always a class. We are chapter 35. And new chapters are always super, super, super exciting because... If you weren't following, if you missed a few classes, you're like, oh, let me wait till this one's over. No, this is new. Anyone that's on, and not only the new chapter, it's actually a new, I mean, this is how I express it because I'm a teacher, a new subunit of Tanya. The Alter Rebbe did not write a teacher's manual to Tanya. If he did, it probably got burnt. So this is all just my understanding. We're starting a new subunit. And to sort of introduce what I mean, let me ask a question. What do you think is the most significant arena in serving God? Is it most important serving God with your thoughts or with your feelings, with your speech, with your action? What do you think is the most powerful way to serve God or the most significant way to serve God and why? It would make sense with speech. Well, Masim actually. So Rachel is saying two things. She said action because there's a quote from our sages. Action is the primary. And she also said speech. Why did you think speech? It's an action. Because with speech, we, we verbalize, you know, speak to Hashem. It's an action also. So you're saying speech is an action, and at the same time, speech is a means of really directly communicating to God. Exactly. In a way that maybe an action you're doing, you can even do it and forget about God, but with speaking, you're talking to Him in a lot of the speech commandments. Anyone else? Any other thoughts? What do you think is most significant? Hmm. We're not letting anyone off the hook for any, don't worry. But if you had to prioritize, what would you put as first? What you thinking? Thoughts about God? Your feelings? Feelings for God or feelings for your fellow man? Feelings for the land of Israel? What you speak? Speaking is saying what's real inside of you, right? We communicate. Speech is communication or you, what you do. Goldie? Well, I mean, you said already, Misa, who I got right. So this is Rachel said, like I quoted her. Actual, yeah, the, the actual, you know, doing the thing is the most important. But I actually was just learning in uh, this safer about davening that it says that um, that without kavana, that tefillas are nothing. That and and so like I today's don't know, is the way today's, that it's, today's <laughs> time is I have to say it was the first time I davened somewhat a drop properly in I don't know how many months. Like, but you can't like read that. <laughs> yeah, no. So it, it, it's talking. It's talking about the idea it's that so like down. Down. it's like I actually wow all the words. <laughs> yes, that was today's portion. It says if you, it was actually comparing for those people that didn't have the benefit of learning what, what Goldie might be referring to. Today's portion, the Tanya, the work that we study is actually divided into a portion for every day of the year. And today's portion, which obviously relates to the spirituality of today, speaks about, he said, intention. And the Rebbe there is it's on a very philosophical, deep, mystical level, basically saying, if you study Torah 
without intention, I mean, but you're still studying, you're still learning, you're still absorbing. Okay, you're accomplishing. I mean, you're learning what God wants. You're connecting your mind with God. But if you pray without intention, what are you doing? I was hoping it carried up some of <laughs> So, the, But the Rebbe said, the comfort <laughs> after hearing that yes. is, <laughs> but you're not praying for negative. You're not saying like, oh, I want to, I don't know, make everyone think I'm really holy. So I'm going to pray in my home where nobody sees me, but I'm really doing it for public approval. That's not what's going on. If you're praying, obviously you're praying for God. You just are spacing out on him, like we might be a little familiar with. So therefore, since there's nothing negative, whenever you pray even one prayer properly, all the times you said that prayer without any feeling, all fly on those wings. Wow. So Goldie, now continue after I interrupted you. So therefore. Um, so therefore, if in fact tefillah is a Milotian connection, like it's, it's the same language, it means that this is the way that we connect to God. So like maybe there are other mitzvahs that also connect us with God, but tefillah, the actual words of tefillah, the, 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 the name of it suggests a connection. So if that's the case, then perhaps there could be an argument for Kavana. Now, and Kavana, Kavana means intention. Most people think of intention as cerebral. What's going on in your brain? I'm thinking as I do this act, this should fuse divine levels of God together. This should bring the redemption. This is for the sake of bringing God into planet Earth. This is for the sake of fulfilling God's desire for creation. That, that's intellectual. And that is intention. The most basic intention for those that would like to add some is, this is an easy one. You don't have to be too deep, but you have to remember, I'm doing this God to fulfill your will. That is the most foundational, true, valid intention. You can think that when you're doing anything for God, I'm doing this God to fulfill your will. So that's all in the realm of intellect. At the same time, and Tanya, which speaks a lot about intention, generally goes in the direction that intention is emotion. It's an emotion for God. Of course, when we pray, if we say, hey, I'm paying attention to the meaning of the words, I had intention. I'm doing awesome today. But the real, real intent is a love and fear of God. So from that perspective, intention is saying the emotional domain is the most significant from that perspective. And of course, as it says in Tanya, it speaks a lot about intention in Tanya. And it says intention, love and fear are the two wings of the bird of your commandment. And if a bird doesn't have wings, it's a bird but it's not going anywhere. For a bird to fly, it needs two wings, love of God and fear. So that's a very, so you see Rachel had a very great plug for action. She quoted our sages, action's the primary thing. How can you argue with that? But Goldie said, and again, the primacy of intention, and as the Alter Rebbe says that the wings of the birds, without those wings, our birds going nowhere. Anyone else? Any other thoughts on what's the most significant? Action, speech, feeling, thought in serving God. Since we're physical beings, and dare protect Tony and everything, but I'm just wondering, could we include thoughts, feelings, kavanas also as actions? Because it's coming from a physical person with a physical brain and physical heart. And So thought, oh, no. Thought, no. Speech, yes. Our sages say, and Hasidus uses this concept, and that's what Firma was referencing before, that speech is considered a minor action. It's a certain type of action because you're moving your lips. But thoughts and feelings we don't put as an action. According to Hasidic thought, this is one domain, this is another domain, this is another domain. They're separate domains, so as you're right, they're all, even the most refined one, which is our thoughts, still have a certain concept of physicality because we are physical human beings with physical Say brain, molecular structures, cellular structures, I mean, right? But still we view it as a separate domain. Anyone else? Any other thoughts on this? You can't be wrong. It's open-ended, just to get you thinking. This is Rochel. Can I say something? Sure. I feel like feelings are most important because feelings guide everything else. Like that's exactly what the altar of it would say. That's exactly the foundational premise of the entire Tanya. The entire Tanya. It, and, and Rachel said it so beautifully. Rachel. I have Rachel here and this is Rachel. Rachel said it so beautifully. <laughs> Feelings are guiding us. That is the Alter Rebbe's approach. We like to think our thoughts guide us. What we, because we're intellectual, we're knowledgeable, we're learned. The Alter Rebbe said, no, not most people. Most of the time. Most of us, most of the time, we do 
because we feel, not because we understand. You can ask yourself. I, there are many things we know, but we, I mean, we know this is bad for us. So what are we doing it for? Or we know we need to do this and we, we need to do this and we know we need to do this, but it doesn't happen. But when we feel it happens, and that's actually the premise of the entire time. The Alter Rebbe's point is, I want you to feel for God. I want you to love God. I want you to fear God. Why? Because then everything else is so easy and so natural. Of course, you're going to do everything when you love and fear. If you don't love and fear as much as you understand, it's not going to get you anywhere. There'll be the paro, right? It says paro did it with the Jews out of Egypt. Paro, if you switch around the letters, means in Hebrew, the back of the neck. The neck. We have a brain. We know lots of stuff. But if it doesn't get to our heart, if Paro doesn't let, if there's a separation between my mind and my feelings, we don't get out of Egypt. We don't move. We're stuck. That's what uh, that's what the Tanya, or maybe even Bar Shemto, before that it was all fear, and then the lad was added, goes together. So what Rachel is saying is a big innovation of Hasidus in general is really bringing in the love energy. There was more emphasis on fear. I think there was love. There was fear. But really, with Hasidus, just the whole concept of emotion got strengthened. Mm -hmm. Both love and fear. Fear not in a like, oh, I'm scared, I'm going to get whacked. That's not what we really mean in Hasidic terminology when we say fear. We mean like a sense of God's presence, sense of him here, an awe, which nullifies me because he's here. That's what we really mean by fear in that lingo, in that terminology. And there was emotion before, there was some fear, there was maybe a little less love, but it just wasn't very strong because they didn't have Hasidus. But when you have Hasidus, you learn about God directly. So the more you learn about God, the more he's close, the more he's real, and the more you have emotions. But if you're not learning about God, he's far. And if he's far, it's hard to have emotions for a, a word, a term, a concept, something so remote from you. So the reason why I was asking this is to introduce what we're now, as I said, our new subunit of Tanya, because, so this is the good news for people that totally spaced out for the past 34 chapters. I believe that chapter 35, 36, and 37 is one unit of thought. And the entire unit, you can see the thread of the supremacy, drum roll please, of action. <laughs> now, that does not take away anything anyone else said. Because I can point to different chapters in Tanya Absolutely. where you would see the supremacy of thought. And different chapters in Tanya, the supremacy of emotion. So, and, and so what's the Alter Rebbe? He's like, you know, confused. I mean, the same author is saying all of this. I think it's case specific, situation specific, contextual. It's all <laughs> significant. It's all, it's sort of like, I remember many times with students, if I would be teaching them a talk of the Lava Jarebbe, Somehow, like oddly enough, whatever the date the Rebbe is talking on is the most important, incredible date ever, ever. And it's like, what an opportunity. Every day you say the same thing. <laughs> like make up your mind. I, I'd buy it if I knew the one. If it's 350 plus, I don't know. But the point is the Rebbe very sincerely felt that every single day. He's not living in the past. He's not living in the future. He's living in the now. And in the now, the best day of your life is happening right now. This is the best Tanya class you've ever experienced. Definitely the best class you've ever experienced. This is the best hakel you've ever experienced. This is the best mashka you've ever experienced. This is it. This is now. It's not there. It's <laughs> <laughs> we. I, I always think it's one of the hardest lessons the Rebbe modeled for us. Yeah. No, meaning there's a lot of like, as we call them, Rebbe stories, where a story, the Rebbe made this miracle, this person was childless for 20 years, and this child, this person was childless for 25 years, this person was childless for 30 years. They're great, incredible miracles, but the only thing I can learn from them is the Rebbe's power and my belief and my nullification. But then there's the Rebbe modeling for us how we should be. And this isn't a story, but if you study the works of the Rebbe, I think this is a very strong and challenging theme. Live in the present. Live in the present. I guess we live in the past and in the future. Most of us. Most of the time. It's sort of easier. But the Rebbe's like the present. So what's the most amazing day to present? What's your favorite holiday? The holiday that's right now happening. Your favorite holiday. This is it. This is the best. In Tanya, depending on which chapter you're learning, 
That would be the, the answer to the question, which means it's all true. The ultimate thing is your inner world of thought. And the ultimate thing is your feelings, your relationship with God. That's the motor that pulls the whole caboose, for sure. And the ultimate thing is Hamasehuikar. Bottom line, for now, for the next three chapters, that's what we're going to focus on. Guess what? Right when we finish, chapter 37 is all about intellect and feeling. Intention as in thought and intention even more strongly as in feeling. So everyone's going to get in the limelight. But for the next three chapters, and we move quite slowly, it's action. So let's look inside chapter 35. That's it. Very cryptic. That was a question. It sounded like a statement, but by the way, that was a question. Meaning we are now introducing, I already told you the punchline, the most important thing is action, but I didn't really tell you anything in the chapter because this is not like simplistic. This is Tanya and this is chapter 35. So we're going to understand very profoundly, spiritually, and in terms of bringing redemption, Mashiach, why action is the most important thing. Actually, in this unit is the chapters on Mashiach. Yes, there are chapters on Mashiach and Tanya. There are two and they're right here. 35 introduces significance of action. 36, Mashiach, action. 37, Mashiach, action. So action and Mashiach are, as we'll see, very, very interwoven. Yeah. But we're introducing everything here with a question. We're actually introducing it with two questions. One's a technical linguistic question, and one is a more philosophical question. So for people who like technical, we have a question. For people who like philosophical, we have a question. The first question, as in this first sentence, is to better understand the word la asoso. La asoso means to do it. Like, you know, just do it, to do it. What's the question? What does that mean? That doesn't sound like a question. It sounds like a statement. It's cryptic. Yes, it is cryptic, but we're in class, so all is good. This is ref circling back to the opening foundational verse of the entire Tanya. Now, when I say the entire Tanya, I mean the first section. There are actually five books within Tanya, but when we say Tanya, we mean the first one. The first book of the five has 53 chapters. If you wondered why we're learning 53 chapters, it's to understand one verse. You're like, oh my gosh, what if I want to understand three verses? I'd really be in trouble. We need 53 chapters to really get it. And the verse we keep coming back to on deeper and deeper levels. So now we're coming back to it one more time. What is the verse? The matter is very close to you in your mouth, the element of speech, in your heart, thought and feelings to do it, action. Why do we need 53 chapters to understand it? Because Moshe, Moses, is telling the Jewish people, the most to you, the realm of your speech, the realm of your feelings, the realm of your emotions, your intellect, your action, so easy to serve God. And we're like, really? How come I never realized that? Don't think that way to me at all. It actually seems sort of like difficult, challenging, a lot of work on my part. It never viewed it as like easy, let alone very easy. So it says, don't worry, 53 chapters later, it'll all be clear. Uh -huh. So that's what we're into. So we've been explaining this verse on various levels already for 34 chapters. So now we're coming back to it again. We're circling back with a different angle, a different question, a new question. What's our question? The truth is we semi-asked this question in chapter 17, but now we're slightly deviating from what we said before. What's our new question? Our question is on the syntax of the wording here. In your mouth and in your heart, which is the realm of both thought and emotion, to do it, action, speech, thought, action. That sounds weird. It does sound weird because we never say it like that. We either say action, speech, thought, or we say thought, speech, D. What's the, well, maybe we just have a weird logic. No, it makes a lot of sense. Why would I say action, then speech, then thought? Because I'm going from my most outward expression to my most inward action, outward, to speech, which is more inward, but still communication to someone else, to thought, my inner reality, from outside to inside. Or you like it better, go from inside to outside. My thought, my inner world, then my speech, how I take this inner world and express it outward, then my action, things that are totally outside of me. Thought, speech, deed. What is the logic in speech, thought, action? Great. 
We'll find out. That was the first question. Now we're going to ask our, that was our textual question. Now we're going to get philosophical. And also to understand a little bit our existential purpose of existence. Why do we exist? Now, obviously, why do we exist is a very broad question. But the Rebbe here is going to narrow that down to a very specific thing that can make us feel, what's the point of it all? What's the point? So what's bothering me that I would say, what's the point? The Rebbe says, What's the point of the creation of a Benoni? Us, we're striving to be, want to be Benoni. I mean, I understand the purpose of a tzaddik, of a completely, holy, perfect person. I get that. I get what he is doing, but a Benoni is not like that. A Benoni struggles, I mean, basically the regular Benoni struggles his entire life. A Benoni is always struggling, a Benoni is always striving, a Benoni is always battling. What's the purpose of that? What's the purpose of our souls coming into this physical world? List lavish benevish habahamis? To be engarbed in an animal soul? To make a clip of a citra akra of evil? In other words, I'm a piece of God. Every single one of us is a piece of God. We're not exactly creator, but we're not exactly creation. We're the closest to creator you get. We're literally a piece of God. That's the core of our soul. And here's this soul. It comes down into an animal soul, into a body. Meaning we sort of think of it like, here's my godly soul, here's my animal soul. There's a bit of a fight and I always try to win. It's much more intimate than that. There's a much more intimate relationship than that. Because my godly soul does not directly interface with my body because a body's physical and a godly soul's quite high. So therefore for my godly soul, it's actually encased in my animal soul, which is an animal, but at least it's a spiritual animal. It's a spiritual entity, it's not physical. So here's my godly soul and she got put in an animal soul around which is an evil inclination. And I'm like, I feel so bad here. Look at that pain she's going through. She's so intimately interwoven with an animal soul that only desires, led by the evil inclination, to indulge, then indulge more, then find other ways of not doing it God's way with a lot of animal brute energy. And my my beautiful soul has to endure this every second of her existence. Why don't I feel so bad for the creation of the tzaddik, of the perfectly godly person? Because he overcomes it. He loves God enough, hates evil enough, destroys his evil inclination, transforms his animal to godly, oh, it's good, it's, it has a great ending. The rest of eternity, his godly soul is in his animal soul, that's also now part of his godly soul. Life is good. But that's not the script for the Benoni. The Benoni is always struggling. His godly soul is always within animal energy. It doesn't sound like a great situation. It sounds painful. Why is God doing this to me? Why is God doing this to my soul, which is a piece of him? Why, what's the point? What's the purpose? If I would overcome, I get it. A long journey, but I'm going to get there at the end. I don't have any vision of that. So what's the point? May actually yuchul l'shalcha kol yamehem. The Benjamin's are never able to completely expel his animal from inside of him. That's not going to happen. That's that, that's not our hope. It's not our vision. He can't extract it from its place. It's on the left side of the heart. He can't master it and transform it that it won't bother him and constantly send up thoughts that he has to constantly push away. The animal is not as strong and stronger than when it entered this world. It just constantly gets more and more energized and vitalized, young, rejuvenated. The animal soul never gives up. The animal soul always keeps fighting. We probably know that. We're actually a little shallow. Okay, you're abandoned. He's fine. So the garment, the expressions, the thought, the speech, the deed. Ain't of a slob shim goof on canal. We're not ever taking the body. I mean, you are abandoned. You're doing a pretty good job of the struggle. But it's always a struggle your whole life. And the struggle's never going to end. And there's never going to be a conquest of that evil. So what's the point? Why are we doing this? So the Rebbe actually is going to sort of express again this question and then very cryptically give an answer. The in king. And if so, why are our souls in this world struggling for nothing? Struggling and not getting anywhere. Struggling in vain. Why? Why do we have to do this for? He love him, call you may in my All life to be fighting with the evil inclination. We're probably aware of that as well. 
and you're never gonna overcome. You're never gonna finish the fight and truly win. Okay, you won a skirmish, but the battle continues. And then you won another skirmish, and you won another skirmish. But the battle always continues. That's first question again. Why is La Soso there out of order? And now this is the deeper, as I said, very existential question. Why are we here if we know we're never going to end this battle? Now, parenthetically, the good news is we are. Because we know she is coming. We know a Mashiach. We're evil will be out of business. God's taking care of it. We are all going to serve God just with godly power. Each one, we're not going to look like cookie cutters of each other. <laughs> we're making up a chaim on that one. Again, no cookie cutter images. My service will look different than your service will look different than your service will look different than your service. We all are original, but we all will not have to struggle with evil. But traditionally, for 5,783 years, people did. What was the point? So the Rebbe says, very briefly the answer. Sort of hard to decode the answer. And so brevity, but I'm going to read it and then we'll talk. This is the comfort. The Rebbe says, I sense the distress here. I sense the pain. There's comfort. There's actually double comfort, very strong comfort. Re to rejoice your soul in God. This is the answer now. That's your answer. Because God's with you. So meaning in their studies of Torah, I mean... As you study Torah, the Torah... Uh -huh. And the avodah is all your service of God. Mm -hmm. Anytime you serve him, that's when you show him. He is inside of you. Mm -hmm. This is the answer. It's a very powerful answer. And we're going to spend a chapter unpacking it. But this is the, the punchline of the answer. The Rebbe, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. It's very unusual because we don't usually get like a punchline answer. We usually like do it the other way. We understand, 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 and we come to an answer. The Rebbe says, I'm giving to you straight. What's the point of your existence? Because God's inside you. Because God's with you. Because you're one with God. Now, of course, in a sense, every one of us is one with God. Every second of our life, no matter what we're doing, no matter how we're rebelling against him, how we're, God forbid, spitting in his face, he's with us. But from this perspective of this chapter, we're going to discuss and explain how he's with us in a revealed way. I will understand what we mean by revealed way when we serve him. Every second of our service God's inside of us, and therefore it's worth it. It's worth it, it's worth it. God's with you, it's worth it. And going back to the Rebbe, there's there's a number of stories of the Rebbe where the Rebbe brings out that point very strongly. And I think, because this is just such a core issue. It's a core issue for loads of reasons. It's a core issue to just give us a sense of self-worth, God-worth. As the Rebbe is saying here, what's your life worth? Well, now your life is worth it. There's actually, if anybody wants to Google, there's a nice gem video clip. I've watched it several times. I find it very powerful. Um, of course, being me, I don't remember the name of the person. <laughs> Maybe if someone's seen it, they can chat it or say it. But it's very powerful. And this man, oh gosh, I, whatever, it'll come to me. I'll, I'll, I'll put it on our WhatsApp group. Because how are you supposed to search for it on his name, right? That wasn't so helpful. This man was very far off. He had just done like a Rolling Stone tour, you know, dot, 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 what all that means. Very far. And he actually was in a serious depression at this moment. He doesn't say all the details in the gem clip. He was in a very serious depression and, and, and sort of also feeling like existential angst. What's anything worth? He had actually been raised Orthodox, Holocaust survivors, left everything big time now was dabbling in like Buddhism and just was very, probably suicidally depressed. Mm -hmm. Anyway, cut a long story short, because I just want to bring this point. I'll leave out the details. He has an encounter with Lubavitcher Rebbe. He comes, he accosts the Rebbe as the Rebbe is going to go into the <sighs> 770 for the afternoon services, the Mincha prayer. He's looking exactly like someone that was just on a Rolling Stone tour should look. <laughs> and he's having this conversation with the Rebbe. And the first half of the conversation, he says to the Rebbe, Rebbe, where's God? And the Rebbe said, God's everywhere. He said, I know that, but where is God? And the Rebbe said, and the Rebbe's pointing, people that were there actually remember, it was like a very vivid uh, sight. The Rebbe said, in the stone, in a tree, 
in everything is God. And he said, Rebbe, I know, but where is God? And the Rebbe looked at him and the Rebbe said, inside of you, if you're asking like that. Wow. That's the answer. When a Jew says, where is God? The answer you're craving and the answer you need and the answer that's your ultimate truth is God is inside of you. you want to know his name? Yeah, Esther. What's his name? I know him. His name is Ellie Lasky. Right, right. Of course you know him. He's from Buffalo. He was in Buffalo. Exactly. Yes. Okay, so Esther can fill us in more details. I'll just give the second half of the story and then Esther can fill in more because, right, he's Buffalo. He was at the University of Buffalo. That was his connection to Chabad. So... Um, that was the first half of his conversation. And the second half, he basically said to the rabbi, like, what's the difference? A, a Jew, a black man, an Indian man, we're all the same. What's the difference? And the rabbi said, and I don't know if I'm quoting him perfectly, so I definitely would recommend seeing the video to get this point very clear. But the rabbi said, a black man can serve God by being a black man, the best as a black man he can be. And an Indian can serve God by being the best as an Indian he can be. And a Jew serves God by keeping Torah and mitzvot and thereby becoming one with God. I might be slightly misquoting that line. And it's, again, it's a very, very significant line. As I said, I've listened to it a few times. My brain isn't so good to remember these details, but it was so powerful, this mm -hmm. point. So powerful, this point. Every human on this world, a creation of God. Every human on this world can serve God. Every human on this world, significant importance. I give a class once a week to Noahide's amazing women doing amazing things. But a Jew is not like the black man or the Indian or the white man. A Jew connects to God through Torah and Mitzvah. And that, nobody else has like us. <clears throat> and that's why Jews do. But again, Elliot Lasky, look it up. It's, it's, it's worth watching. Our core piece is knowing God is inside of us. God is inside of us. God is inside of us. And when you get that point, you can keep moving. You can walk. Why? What's the point? Why should I bother being nice and patient when that person's being so rude? Being calm when I just want to lose it. Davening when I've got such a pressured day and I know I'm going to do a bad job. Hashem is with you. Hashem is in you every second and overtly in you every second. And I think with that, we will stop this chapter. Okay, so this is from the very end of 1991, this time of year. And this was the, the Torah portion of Toldos. And it's a very powerful talk of the Rebbe. I actually view these three Torah portions as like a trilogy, meaning Vayera, Chayser, and Toldos, in my mind, is this trilogy of thought because Vayera ends, the, the talk of the Rebbe in Vayera, at the end of 1991, ends with this very strong... Mashiach energy mm -hmm. telling us, and again, it's a build up of the whole talk. I'm just saying in a second, for those who want more information, you can ask me later after class. Mashiach is not only here, of course, Mashiach is always here. There's always a Mashiach as part of Jewish faith, but he is already revealed. You're like, what? He is? Mashiach is already revealed. November of 91. The next week, the next installment, maybe a serial novel is a better metaphor for it. The next installment, which was last week's Torah portion of Chai Sarah, it was the week, as last week, of the convention of all the Chabad emissaries. Amazing, if you saw the a picture of their taking their picture. <laughs> and you're like, my, my boy, my son was in New York then. He said to me, why is the Eastern Parkway blocked off? This was the night before. There's, there's bleachers in Eastern Parkway. I think you mean in the service lane. He said, yeah. I said, how do you think they take such a picture? Wow. And it, my, my daughter showed me, I guess it was flying around WhatsApp, like a picture from the first convention yeah. of the emissaries, which was like in the mid 80s. To now. To now. Amazing. Amazing. And keep on growing. Absolutely. So to what was the Rebbe's message to his emissaries in the end of 91? This is, this is his official address. Mm -hmm. The Fabrain is the official beginning of the convention. Doesn't matter how many days you've been workshopping. And it's his official address. What was his official address? Again, an amazing talk full of so much. But his message to his emissaries was the work of being an emissary of Shlichus. Did a great job. You're done. I said, we finished the beginning of the work. We finished the middle of the work. 
oh, we finished the laundry work. And you're like, really? Everybody in my neighborhood keeps kosher and they didn't ask me to kosher their kitchen. Everyone in my neighborhood has mezuzahs. I didn't sell them to them. I didn't give them to them. I didn't give them to them. Never says, don't get stuck on the details. I see. What you needed to accomplish as emissaries, you did a great job. Yes, you got it. There's only one thing left. Beginning, middle, and done. But there's one thing left. To accept Mashiach in actuality so he can do his job and redeem the Jewish people. Can you say it in Hebrew? That was the message. It was an amazingly strong talk. This is my mandate to you. There's a gate open in heaven. It's a new gate. It's called Mashiach. And bring this message to every single Jew without exception. Except Mashiach, so he can do his job in regime. So now we're in the third installment. So now we're in the, the, the finishing. This week's Torah portion, which is actually a, a rather deep talk for people that like deep talks. And again, I'm not going to go through all the details, but just this bottom line point the Rebbe says is there's the thing as it exists. The Rebbe is a great teacher. So the Rebbe taught us this concept through layers and layers of the top till it comes to the Mashiach, the finale and punchline. Just like the moon. You have the birth of the moon. Rosh Chodesh, the birth of the moon. Coming up. When the moon is born, it's smallest in terms of the light that we experience. But within that sliver, everything is contained. For us to see that full moon in all of its glory, it's gonna take 15 days. And then we see the moon with all of her light shining. But that can't compare to the moment of birth, to that sliver. When we have everything, though not yet in a revealed fashion. Oh, wow. And then the Rebbe compares that to a child and an adult. And the Rebbe shows on three levels the supremacy of a child to an adult. Even though the adult is like the 15th and the child is like their birth. But in many ways, the child's miles ahead of us. And then the Rebbe explains this is Mashiach. We have Mashiach in his essence existence. And we have Mashiach revealed. Mm. And the Rebbe compares that to the air of Mashiach and the light of Mashiach. For those that know Hebrew, you can appreciate this concept. Air is embedded within the word, I'm sorry, light is embedded within the word air. Air is the avir. Light is or. Avir, aleph, love, yud, resh, contains the word or plus yud, God's energy. Wow. So light is hidden within that avir, that that air. And actually the Rev explains, of course, there's a relationship because without oxygen, there's not going to be any light. The flame will be extinguished if you remove the oxygen. Without the air, there's no light. <laughs> the Rebbe says that, what is this air? This air is the air of Mashiach. When did that air start wafting in our air world? The primordial moment of creation. Our sages say on the verse, second verse of the entire Torah, the Ruach Elohim Revachetes Apnei Hamayim. The Spirit of God hovered over the waters as everything's darkness and chaos. Our sages say that's the Spirit. That's oh, the Mashiach. air yeah. of Mashiach. The Mashiach starts off as the air, nebulous. You can't exactly grasp it. You don't exactly see it, but it's in the air. The light of Mashiach, as our sages say, Oral Shal Mashiach. The light of Mashiach is when you see him. You see him by his actions. He redeemed us. We're dancing in the streets of Jerusalem. We're eating that Leviathan, the Leviathan, and the Shara Bar. We know what it's going to look like. That's the light of Mashiach. Redemption as we understand the meaning of the word. The Rebbe says, how do you move from the air to the light? By identifying Mashiach. Mm. The identification of Mashiach is what enables his light to emerge. Mm. That is what the Rebbe says. And then to give us a model of this, the Rebbe says, where do we see this historically? With Bathsheba. Bathsheba, one of the wives of King David. So toward the end of David's life. David was very sick at this time point. His whole life was borrowed time, actually. That's a separate story. He's weak. He's sick. Bathsheba knew, and David had promised her, that her son, Solomon, would be the next king. David is weak, David is sick, and one of David's sons thinks, I'm going to already start getting my, you know, fingers on the throne. And he starts acting like a king and gathering people around him like a king. And Bacheva's was like, uh-oh, <laughs> my son, this little child, really, I think it was maybe nine at the time, he's supposed to be the next king. 
But this person's flaunting himself as the king. David, we're not the first people that sometimes we go through stuff with our children. Trust me, you ever feel anything? Go Don't read the prophets. <laughs> so, so, she, and she started speaking to a major prophet at that time, Nasan Hanavi, Nasan, Natan the prophet. And they're like, yeah, Solomon's supposed to be the king. That's what God wants. David promised, but he's on his deathbed and this one's going to take over. In cahoots, they plotted. Bathsheba's supposed to go. She goes and she basically says to David, you know, you're getting really old. You promised my son's going to be the king after you. So-and-so has his eyes on the throne. If he's going to be the king after you, you got to proclaim it now because you're about to die. And before you die, you should say this so that after you die, Solomon will be the king. And when David agreed, which he did right away, but Sheva said, after using the word die, probably like four times in the sentence, long live my master David forever. Wow. And it's like, huh? Wow. You're about to die. And before you die, so after you die, long live David now forever. And the Rev explains what she was saying was now, now that you've ensured You're the throne, be wow. now wow. you've ensured the line of Mashiach, because oh, Mashiach wow. is a descendant of David through exclusively Solomon. Now that the line of Mashiach is guaranteed, you will live forever, because now through you will come the Redeemer. And the Rev said this. Her proclamation, Yechi, Adaini, Amelech, David, La'ilam, this is an example of identifying Mashiach in the air, his existence, which enables his light to shine. So, with this, the Rebbe is giving us such strength, such power. We've been living with it for many, many years. We want it to happen. And I, I took on this year, I started seven years ago with my son, Beryl, what I called a hakel, because it was a hakel year seven years ago. And we've been doing it ever since. I do it every day. I, I started it because Beryl, for the past seven years, has been in public school. And I wanted him to have this sort of spiritual protection and energy. And it, very religious about it. And every year I got to like, his birthdays, add a bit more, add a bit more, add a bit more. A kid said, what are you going to do now? It's a hakel year, Ma. You really got to add. I was like, oh, yeah, I don't really feel up to adding much. <laughs> so what I added was that every day in his hakel, I'm going to tell him something about Mashiach. That was my hakel addition to his hakel. And this week, last week, it's been, you know, I, I usually take the same thought and say it for a few days in a row, which obviously is good for him, the repetition. Like the Rebbe says, we've done everything. The only thing we need to do is identify Mashiach. And then he's coming. And as we say, Yechi, we make it happen. Mm -hmm. thank you for joining our in-person and virtual hotel i so appreciate it thank you for celebrating your birthdays in our class which i think is an annual tradition thank you very much really nice we should all continue walking forward achieving growing and taking the energy of this year to be in such a different place for the next seven and beyond thank you Amen. Thank you.